The Sutra is a concise form of the Transcendent Wisdom Sutra, uh, which the Buddha taught. Eight, there are 18 different versions of, of his teaching, which range from one syllable to 100,000 lines. And this is very nice, pretty short. It's not one syllable, but it's pretty short. And uh, this is the, the kind of the announcement of the reality. And I will give a little commentary on it as we go. But perhaps we will do this. This will be our inner science bit uh, at the beginning of the classes. And that puts one in a good mood. And also, there's a tradition in Tibetan that when you chant this sutra in a group, if there's any bad spirits hanging around, when they hear this sutra, they run away. <laughs> and then you do a thing of going like this at the end three times, and that, uh, that makes sure they go. And um, it's a funny story, you know, when the British invaded Tibet, and they first they killed quite a few people of the attempt of an army that the Tibetans mounted, stopped them out in the southern part, which failed very much. And then when they got to Lhasa, everybody was applauding, the British thought. <laughs> but actually, <coughs> they were making a last-ditch defense. <laughs> Trying to make them leave. But it didn't work, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, so can we read this? And so you start by reading the title. Okay. That's what follow my lead, but don't just let me do it. Please, everyone chant. In Sanskrit, but, whoa, Justin, what is this? Why is that going? Feedback. Because you guys don't have your mics on. What? You guys don't have your mics on. You have to have your mic. You have to have your mic on your body, otherwise it catches up on the catches the whole whole room. <laughs> You're fine. It's it's Genla. What happened? Genla just needs to put his mic on before he turns it on. Oh. <laughs> otherwise, it picks up all the ambient noise. Okay, in Sanskrit, Bhagavati. Let's go. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hadaya, in Tibetan, Chogden Deva Shira Jingbo, in English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Rajagurha, together with great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that these five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Thereupon, impelled by the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shadiputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Shadiputra, thus, Shadiputra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness. Voidness is matter. Voidness is not other than matter. Neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, likewise, all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, undecreased and unincreased. Shariputra, thus in voidness, there are no matter, no sensation, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality sense media. There are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance and so on, up to no old age and death and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment either. Come on, Park, I don't see anyone. Therefore, Shari Kutra becomes the Bodhisattva is without attainment. He lived in reliance on transcendent wisdom, and her spirit is unobscured and free of fear. 
passing far beyond all confusion, she ultimately succeeds in nirvana. And all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood and unexcel perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom. The unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth, the transcendent wisdom mantra, as follows, Panyata. Om Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sangati Bodhisattva Om Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sangati Bodhisattva Om Gati Gati Para Gati Para Sangati Bodhisattva Shariputra, thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the blessed Lord arose from Patsumadi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent, noble son, so it is, so it is. Once you practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it, and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. When the blessed Lord has spoken thus, the venerable Chara, Dhatiputra, the noble Bodhisattva, Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world, with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies, rejoice, and all applaud what the Buddha said. Okay, then clap three times. Very good. Very good. So now there's no bad spirits in the whole place. And that's what... Uh, that. So, you know, <clears throat> you notice that it's a female Buddha, the transcendent wisdom, because the female is associated with wisdom, and the male with compassion, you know, well-meaning but dumb. <laughs> That's the male. <laughs> and female is wise, also well-meaning. And uh, that's one point. And then the second point is that this is a special sutra where Buddha is not teaching it himself, but he's in a samadhi, that is to say a state where he emanates this attention to the deep nature of reality. And then Avalokiteshvara, who is the, actually the incarnation of compassion of all Buddhas, he's a bodhisattva, celestial bodhisattva, you know, like the Karmapa, the Dalai Lama, there's lots of emanations of Avalokiteshvara, not just one. And uh, he is meditating on this transcendent wisdom, and then he sees through everything. Everything becomes transparent when he sees. And then Shariputra, who is the foremost of the monks, being a dualistic Theravada Buddhist. By that I mean he's one who thinks that the world is one thing, and Nirvana and freedom is another thing, somewhere outside. And, uh, and so, but, but then he knows there's this transcendent wisdom, non-duality, non-dualism, so he asks Avalokiteshvara, like, how do you do it? And notice he only asks about the noble son, and Avalokiteshvara answers noble son or noble daughter. Mm -hmm. But that's like, there's kind of a little bit of chauvinism in there. And then the main sort of point is that matter is voidness, voidness is matter. And what that means is what I said yesterday, it isn't that voidness or emptiness is some place beyond the atoms. It includes all the atoms and molecules and structures and illusions and whatever you want, dreams and seemingly solid things, but it is the level of it where it is sort of more subtle, it is that super subtle clear light level. But it's not outside of all those things, it is all of those things. And the fact that they are empty of intrinsic reality means they only have relative reality. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing about anything not even the tiniest atom that exists out of its own self, out of its own essence, or its own they call it intrinsic reality. Everything exists only in relation to other things. Okay? What? Intrinsic reality. Kunzo Dembar. Kunzo Dembar. Kunzo Dembar. Relativity. And you don't have any relativity in relationality. And there's no... And, and it, at first that seems obvious to everyone, because of course absolute means it's, uh, it doesn't connect to anything else. It's absolute. It has no solution. It's ab away from, in, you know, dissolution into anything else or melting into anything else. And the absolute, therefore, some sort of ultimate. We have an idea of that. But the error that we make that causes all our suffering from Buddha's insight and his analysis is 
that we think like I'm there's something I'm I'm irreducibly me, and I'm different from everything else, and I know I'm really me. That's the thing that's really real to me, and also that's a real table. I know it. This is the floor. That's a real atom, and whatever you know. And it mean, by real, I mean sort of it's there by itself as an objective thing. And that means, without me realizing it, I'm projecting into the status of existence of that thing that it has intrinsic reality. Its reality is conferred by its own unwavering essence. And of course, I habitually think that my notions and my concepts and my labels and my names uh, correspond to that essence of the thing. You know, like Plato's ideas or all kinds of other concepts that people have come up in history. Whereas Buddha's experience was that everything, when you look for any one thing, it will dissolve under analysis. And then even the state of being in dissolution, if you look for that, although you will come up with that when you look for some non-dissolved thing, but when you then look at the state of being dissolved, that also dissolves and it makes room for all of the things. And so they're still there, but now they're there in a new way, only by interrelated to each other. And what that means is, at first, it might seem strange. And actually, when you approach that experience yourself, if you first become a great philosopher, and you investigate everything, and then you have the, the and then you combine that with concentration, and everything done, you have an experience of disappearing and everything else disappearing. And then you. Um, uh, uh, you then you realize that, but then the state of disappearance also disappears if you really remain focused and don't cling on to that state. And when that happens, you're back with everything, but now you know that it's something like an illusion. It's like a person who has never seen a mirror and who, when they see one, they reach into the space that they think the mirror is a window onto and they bang onto the surface. And then, whoa, you know, and then pretty soon they realize, although they look in the mirror and it looks like a three-dimensional thing in that window, it isn't. It's a reflection of what's behind them. So they mentally correct the misperception that they have that there's a three-dimensional thing in the mirror right away without even thinking. Similarly, when you have the disappearance experience, which you are quite frightened of, when you, you feel like maybe I'm going to disappear, I'm going to die, I won't exist anymore, it seems like everything will be nothing, it's like a slight fear of it, not actually quite a great fear, actually. <laughs> it's usually people can have. But if one braves that by realizing that you can't get lost in nothing because actually there is no nothing, <laughs> and you're just getting rid of an illusion, actually, and at that point you're back, and now you're in a completely new situation because everything is more fluid, it's more like a dream, it's more like it can be changed more easily. So you can become young. You can rejuvenate, you can become enlightened, you can be free of this or that addictive, reactive mentality. You can completely, everything is pure potential, in other words, when you really realize that. Nothing is stuck the way it seems to be. Everything is transformable. So it doesn't mean that everything is only mental either, because at that deep state, mind and matter are not different. So, so it's more subtle than just idealism. Okay? And the, and the mantra, it means gate is a past passive participle of the verb gam to go. So gate means literally it's like saying gone, gone. Paragate means very gone. Parasamgate means very totally gone. And bodhi means enlightenment. And swaha means all hail. And om is just invoking body, speech, and mind of all the Buddhas throughout space and time. So it celebrates different stages. <coughs> so the Parasamgate is a sort of the disappearance experience, but the Bodhi, enlightenment, is then the return, or rather realizing that one is here appearing while disappearing in a certain way, so that you're here in a new way of total interconnectedness, actually. There's no longer the sense of a separateness of this, in the same way. Uh, you know, one realizes that the separateness is only a notion. And therefore, you're like a Buddha, you're an empathetic and compassionate being. Okay, so that's all the commentary I'm going to make about it, the moment. And uh, so that's how we start. And then, as I said, you know, bad spirits who are just beings who have pursued the frustration of being a separate being against the universe and losing to the universe, so they become bitter and grumpy, and they have no joy, 
So they, and they don't like other people having joy. They go around like trying to like block their joy and they do, they, they gnaw on the other people. But they go away when they hear this because they don't like it. They don't want to be together with other people. They're scared of being cheerful. They really are. So they want to leave the union. Brexit. <laughs> Morons. Anyway, okay, that's it. Notice. I'm sorry for intruding a little inner science this morning. <clears throat> okay? Okay. <laughs>